In this video, I'm going to be talking about the differences between half and full duplex methods of communication. And I'm going to be tying that into how exactly that might work inside of an FPGA. So with a focus on implementing half and full duplex communication inside of your FPGA. Now, half duplex and full duplex are both methods of communication. They're not unique to FPGAs, but I thought it'd be good to give a little bit of a review on what those look like in case you're not familiar with it. So half duplex, you can imagine, is the, the two, a, a two-way radio example where one person, you know, both people have a radio, and if you want to talk, you need to hold down the button and you're talking and you're transmitting. The other person needs to let go of their button in order to hear you. If they both people push the button at the same time, nobody can hear each other at all. So uh, there is some agreement, some handshaking that needs to occur with a half duplex system. You need to talk and then say over so the other person knows that you're done and then you'll release your button and they can talk to you. Um, so you know, half duplex, one person talking, one person listening. Full duplex, both people talking, both people listening at the same time. Data can go in both directions at the exact same time. There are pros and cons to both of those systems. You know, full duplex in general is simpler. So the transmitter that is assigned to be a transmitter is always a transmitter. The receiver is always the receiver. Uh, and then you have a transmitter on this side, a receiver on this side. I'll show a block diagram of what that looks like in a minute. But things are generally stable and set once they're set up. Uh, but it, the downside is that it does require more physical wires. If it's, a wire, if it's a wired interface, you need to run that many more pairs or you know, individual strands of copper for each direction of communication. There is more bandwidth available to you as well, so you can be downloading some data in this way while you're uploading data in this direction. And it is non-blocking, so I can think back to the, the uh, two-way radio example. You don't block the other person sending data to you when you're sending data to them. Um, in a full duplex method. So half duplex is basically all the opposite thing. So it's generally more complicated because there's an agreement that needs to occur. So if it's radio, you say over, and then you know that the other person can talk. In full duplex, you can just talk to the other person whenever you want. No big deal. Um, similarly, if you implement this at, in an FPGA, you need, to, you need to come up with some sort of agreement, some handshaking that says, I'm done now, your turn. And so when does that happen? Uh, you need to introduce that concept for half duplex, and I'll go into how, how that might work. Um, it requires less wires, so that's a, a big benefit actually. If you if you're pin constrained or you don't want to run copper really far distances, you know you, that might be a benefit to using half duplex. It's half the bandwidth uh, available because only one person can talk or, or listen at any given time. So divide your available bandwidth in half. Uh, that might be okay uh, for for a lot of things, and it is blocking. So again, one person can talk or receive at any given time. So just to give you some examples. Um, protocols that use, you know, maybe protocols that you've heard of, like I squared C, for example. Um, I squared C is a very common interface, you know, with microcontrollers or FPGAs that talk to analog to digital converters, digital to analog converters, um, multiplexers, IO expanders, all sorts of different peripherals, digital potentiometers. And uh, I squared C is one method of communication to talk to those chips. And that is a half duplex method of communication. There's a master and there's some number of, of I, I2C, I squared C slaves, and the master transmits something and then it waits for a response back from the, I, from the slave. Um, that is a half duplex communication method. Um, SPI, which is similar, um, I say similar meaning the use cases are similar for SPI, DAX, ADCs, things like that. Uh, is, is a full duplex communication path. So you can actually send, the master can send data on one line, uh, MOSI, master out, slave in, and it can receive data on master in, slave out at the same time. Um, a UART, which is commonly used to send ASCII data to an FPGA or type on your keyboard and send messages to a microcontroller, something like that. It could be both, kind of depends on your implementation. Um, how you want to exactly design that system. I've, I've seen UARTs that are half duplex communication. I've seen full duplex UARTs. And let's see, one last one to talk about, interesting one is USB. So I actually had to look this up because uh, it was it's both. USB is both half duplex in USB 1.0 and 2.0, but to get the really fast speeds of USB 3.0, they actually have to go full duplex. So um, USB 3.0 has, has that capability, which is kind of cool. So uh, just to show you what, what this looks like from a you know, basic block diagram perspective, um, this little triangle is, is a, 
a driver uh, a driver receiver and so the data is being transmitted at the input of the driver it goes out and it gets sent over a wire and number some number of wires maybe one maybe two who knows um, and this and that's not really important here it gets received by this triangle receiver and received and inside of an FPGA or whatever device this is over here. So maybe this is, you know, microcontroller talking to an FPGA or whatever you, whatever you want. Um, there's two physical wires here, so they can send, each one can send and receive at the same time. That's full duplex. Half duplex, you have two uh, transmitters that are able to talk at each other, um, and the receiver is always listening uh, both of these receivers are always listening. So everything that this, you know, this triangle over here on the left side is sending, this receiver is hearing. So you're basically hearing yourself talking, but you're also hearing when the other guy is talking as well. So if this one is not talking and the one on the right is talking, uh, you know, he'll hear himself, but he'll, but the guy on the left will also receive the data. Um, so this. This does require knowing when to talk in a half duplex communication method. And usually the way it works is it's like a call and response thing where there's a master and a slave and the master is always initiating the transactions and initiating the commands. And so the slave knows I'm, a, I'm gonna listen by default and I'm not gonna try to transmit anything unless somebody talks to me first. And that's, that's commonly done with uh, like I squared C for example and UART communication. You'll notice there's also this TX enable line here. This is this is an enable TXN TX enable. This is an enable line for the transmitter. So by default, you know, let's say this on the left here is the master, and this one's the slave on the right. The the transmit enable on the master is going to be high, meaning this is enabled, and the slave is going to be disabled. So it's not going to be putting any voltage out on this wire interface here. Now, if this transmitter enable were high. While this buffer on the left here was trying to to send data out on that line, what you could actually have collision on the line where both, you know, one's trying to drive a zero voltage zero, one's trying to drive voltage one, and there's contention on the line. And you generally don't want to do that. Um, you could maybe damage a device, but it's just not a great idea to to do that in general. So um, I'm going to talk about how to actually solve that inside your FPGA uh, right after this. Uh, but the you know the, the point here is that you have to you have to toggle this TX enable line based on when you want to be sending and receiving data. Now, in terms of how this all works inside of an FPGA, uh, the the way to do a full duplex inside of an FPGA is actually pretty simple. Um, you have a driver, you have a receiver, and I'll go back to the picture real quick. And uh, th this doesn't change, right? The, your driver is always a driver, your receiver is always a receiver uh, on whichever side you, of the interface you're, you're instantiating. Um, for a half duplex communication scheme though, you do need to care about this TX enable signal, this transmit enable signal. And you need to actually turn that on when, when the FPGA wants to talk and turn it off when the FPGA doesn't want to talk anymore. And that's done in VHDL and Verilog. Um, you can actually instantiate this, uh, sorry, you can infer this. My previous video actually did a video on an inference versus instantiation versus creation via a GUI tool. And we're going to be inferring a what is called a tri-state buffer. So this is a buffer that can be tri-stated and that's called a tri-state buffer. Um, tri-stating means that there are three states uh, for the, for the tri-state buffer. Ooh, I have, okay. This truth table here, I probably, probably should have included this. Uh, so, Here's the truth table for a tri-state buffer. Make this a little bit bigger. Ooh, that's a lot bigger. When the transmitter is enabled, what is on the output is what's on the input. So when TX enables one, the input's a zero, the output's a zero. TX enables one, the input's a one, the output's a one. The interesting thing happens when the TX, the transmitter is disabled, meaning the TX enable is low. Um, now, doesn't matter, I don't care, X's don't care. I don't care what's on my input, my output's going to be Z, or high impedance, which means that anything looking into it is going to see a, a, a high resistive load looking in, which is going to basically not affect the signal. So, it's like an open, it's like an open circuit, basically. It basically removes the buffer from from the voltage, from weighing, pulling down that voltage that's on that line. So again, TX enable here, when this is a Z or high impedance, this turns 
the the buff the buffer into a in high impedance state, which means that looking into the buffer looks like an open uh, there's nothing there, um, and that's how half duplex works. So tri-state buffers are your friend, and I'm going to show you how to create a tri-state buffer right now. So tri-state buffer inside of an FPGA. Let's talk about VHDL first. So let's say you have some signal like uh, I/O data. Uh, and that's a, it's a, declared as an in-out, which means it can be an input when, sorry, input when the FPGA is receiving data and an output when the FPGA is transmitting. So in-out is a reserved keyword inside of VHDL specific to tri-state buffers or any data that goes back and forth in a module. Um, sorry, half duplex data, I guess, is the better thing to say. By declarative type standard logic, it can be whatever type you like. Uh, standard logic is very common. IO data gets some signal that's elsewhere in our design, TX data, this is the input to the buffer, when the transmit enable is high, else Z. So this is creating, um, this is creating that truth table here that we just looked at. So Z is a reserved, uh, is a, is a reserved data type inside of, uh, a d data type of standard logic inside of VHDL, and that's a high impedance type. So this is driving the line to high impedance when the transmitter is low. And when the transmitter is high, it's just taking whatever is on this TX data signal here and jamming it out the buffer. That's it, that's the tri-state buffer, pretty cool. Uh, on the receive side, we also need to be receiving the data. So you can do, you can just do this. You can just assign like some, you know, wire RX data to IO data and it will receive everything that comes in on that line. Again, if you look back at the, the half duplex communication, you know, let's say your FPGA is on the right here. If this guy's transmitting, the receiver is going to be receiving what it transmits, uh, what is being transmitted all the time. So this, whatever's on RX data is going to, is going to be an echo of what TX data shipped out, uh, but you can just ignore it. You can just drop that data to the floor. You don't really, unless you want to listen to yourself, you can do that, but usually you kind of just drop that data to the floor. So when you're transmitting, you don't really care what's on the RX data. When you're listening, you do. So that's a tri-state buffer in VHDL. Real quick, uh, basically the same thing in Verilog, a little bit more compact because Verilog has this nice ternary operator here. So we have an in-out, uh, this is um, the declaration of the data line itself, similar to VHDL. And we can just use an uh, assignment operator here, uh, assignment statement to assign IO data to, uh, okay, so I should explain this in case you haven't seen this before. This is a ternary operator, which means, the way I think about it is, tell me the value of this signal here if it's true, do this. If it's false, do this. So tell me the value of TX enable. If TX enable is true or high, put whatever t TX data is into IO data. So assign this value to this to this value here. Um, if if TX enable is low, then do this condition over here. So do this one tick BZ. So again, Z is high impedance. So assign a high impedance state to IO data when TX enable is low. Ternary operator is very cool, simple way to kind of um, make your code a little bit more compact and more concise. I I like the way that VHDL has when, you know, this when else, because you can kind of cascade them really nicely, like do this when this is true, else do this when this is true, else do this when this is true. You can kind of go crazy with when else's um, in VHDL. In Verilog, cascading ternary operators gets out of hand very fast. Like if you have more than two, it's just good luck trying to decipher what the hell is going on. So ternary operators are great if you have one, like one truth tape, one you know, true false thing you want to decode. Uh, but if you have multiple things you want to cascade, you kind of got to do something different in Verilog. Otherwise, it's just impossible to understand what's going on. That's it. This video became longer than I anticipated, but kind of fun stuff. Uh, if you haven't checked out my Patreon yet, please do so. It's patreon.com forward slash NandLand. I really appreciate the support there. It's been great. It's keeping me motivated, cranking out these videos. So thank you very much if you're a contributor there. I appreciate you so much. And if you haven't gotten yourself a Go board yet, you can try some of this cool stuff, instantiating uh, some, some tri-state buffers. So uh, thanks very much for your support.